And our scripture for today is found in Psalm 119, 9 to 11. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Those blessed words. Well, in our Old Testament first session today, we're going to look at the creation of all things and especially the wonders of Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. And then we'll look at the creation week, uh, the marriage of Adam and Eve, the fall of man, the martyrdom of Abel, uh, the genealogies, and we'll look at the life of Noah and also of Enoch. And that's Genesis 1 through 5, and that's our assignment for this first session. I think, as I say, the greatest most profound verse in all the Bible would be the very first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created all things. And we'll look at that in detail a little later on. I want to begin, though, by actually overviewing the first six days of the creation week. Number one, the first day, the creation of light. And God said, let there be light and there was light. Now, as I understand the scripture, I don't think that he's talking here, the scripture writer's talking about sunlight or starlight or reflected moonlight. I don't think those took those luminaries took place and were shown until the fourth day. Now, some believe that this was a temporary light source to function until the fourth day when the sun, moon, and stars would be created. In other words, it would uh, sort of be uh, one Puritan theologian said it is almost as if God at that time just pulled back the robes of his eternal garment and light flooded from the scene. But in the first day, on the first day, God created L-I-G-H-T, light. Then the second day, the creation of space and water. And God said, let there be a firmament. Now that literally means an expanse, a space in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And as you have in your notes, uh, this water was in two form, regular land-based water in shallow ocean, river, and lake beds. The oceans were not nearly as wide and deep as they are today. And then atmospheric water in the form of invisible, translucent vapor. Uh, the Many believe that the early earth sort of looked like an opaque hothouse surrounded by this water vapor. First day, L-I-G-H-D. The second day, space and water. The third day, the creation of plant life. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. Verse 11. It's a very important verse, and you read for the first time, and you read a number of times after this, a little expression, after his kind or after its kind. Now, this is called the law of biogenesis, and that's an 85-cent word, which simply means that life gives birth to similar life after its kind. And you don't uh, get crocodiles from dogs but you get puppies from dogs, and you can't cross a dog and a cat and get a dat after its kind. And also, I think this refutes the doctrine of evolution that says that life began on some ancient sea surface, but here the Bible says it began on dry land. That's the third day. The fourth day, the creation of the sun, moon, and stars. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. Now, it may be asked why God created the earth on the first day, but he didn't get around to creating uh, the, uh, uh, the sun, moon, and stars until the fourth day, uh, establishing those luminaries. Why the earth first day and the others the fourth day? I think one of the reasons is because of priority. Now, let me just say that the most important piece of real estate in this blooming universe, it isn't the biggest or brightest, but it's the most important, is planet Earth. 
because it was on this earth in the fullness of time that the Lord Jesus would be born. He would be born in Bethlehem, not on Mars or Mercury, but on Bethlehem, in Bethlehem. He would grow up and do his thing, die on the cross, be buried, resurrected, ascended into the heavens, and rumor has it, folks, and it's not rumor at all, that he's coming again, not to Pluto or Mars or some far-off star. He's coming again to planet Earth. So I think that's why God made the Earth on the first day, did not get around to making the sun, moon, and stars until the fourth day. And that's the fifth day, and uh, that's the fourth day then. And then on the fifth day, and this was a remarkable day, the creation of fish and fowl. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the firmament of heaven. What a contrast is seen here on the fifth day. Uh, Perhaps God says in the morning, All right, let's see my uh, schedule calls for me today to make uh, the fish and fowl. So I think I'll start with the top and work down. So he created maybe all the birds of the air. Uh, probably all 12,000 species that are known today, maybe some that have died out. He created them all, uh, perhaps during the morning of the fifth day, including the tiny little hummingbird weighing but a few ounces. And then, you talk about a contrast, in the afternoon, when he created that tiny little hummingbird, he also created the largest creature ever to be associated with planet Earth. And no, I'm not talking about dinosaurs. I'm talking about a creature three times the size of the mighty dinosaur. I'm talking about the blue whale. And it is absolutely staggering how wide and how long and how heavy this blue whale is. Even today, it's longer and heavier and wider than a 737 Boeing jet. And it weighs more than 20 500 people. So the first day, he creates light. The second day, space and water. The third day, plant life. The fourth day, the sun, moon, and stars. The fifth day, fish and fowl. And then the sixth day, he creates, well, let's just see what he creates. He creates something in his own image. But in the morning, the creation of land animals and later on of man. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after its kind. And God saw that it was good. So during the morning, he creates all the animals that creeps upon the earth, including, we assume, the dinosaurs also. And then in the afternoon now, everything is ready, and God is going to construct his most glorious of all creatures. And we read about this. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, if, if we had not known, uh, and we had just read the Genesis for the first time, we would expect, we read on the six times that God said, God said, God said, let there be, let there be. We would assume, okay, this is going to be also the same. God said, let there be. But no, we read, God said, let us. So how personal the account becomes. And by the way, even before we're out of the first chapter in the Bible, we we run, as it were, smack dab into that marvelous but mysterious doctrine known as the Trinity. Let us make man in our image. How was man made in the image of God? And in your notes you have a number of uh, suggestions, but let me just say uh, I think we can summarize it this way. God said, in a few moments now, I'm going to construct a creature that uh, will be in some ways similar to the other creatures. This creature will uh, live upon the earth. It'll breathe. It'll eat. This creature will be able to move around. Uh, This creature will be subjected to the laws of time and gravity. But this creature will be able to do something no other creature will ever be able to do. And that is, before it eats its food, like the other creatures, it'll be able to bow its head, close its eyes, and thank me for that food. Uh, We think of the song here. This creature will be able to sing this song that will be written so many days, so many years later. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thine hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. And when through the woods and forest glades I wander, 
and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees, when I look down from lofty mountain, grander, and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, how great thou art. You see, no mouse or mushroom, no dog or dinosaur can ever sing that song. First day, L-I-G-H-D. Second day, space and water. Third day, plant life. Fourth day, sun, moon, and stars. Fifth day, fish and fowl. Sixth day, animals, and then man himself. And then on the seventh day, the Bible says that God rests from the work. In fact, we read in verse 2 of chapter 2, And on the seventh day God entered, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And by the way, this is the only place in the Bible where God is described as resting. Let me just say this, that there are uh, two great works of God in the Bible and in the history of, uh, of eternity. One, his work in creation, and the other, his work in redemption. And here we hear of his work in creation. And the first two chapters give us that. But beginning in chapter 3, God rolls up his sleeves, and he begins his second great work, that of redemption, and he's still working that work. But sin has not entered the picture, and so we see right now where God can rest, and does rest at the end of the sixth day. Now, he rests not because he's tired or because he's lazy. He works because he rests because his first great work, that of creation, is done. Well, so much about God's work schedule. And now, in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, God's wedding schedule. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh." And here is the first of four great institutions given by God to man. The institution of marriage, and later on we'll see in Genesis 9, the institution of human government, and even beyond that, the institution of the nation Israel in Genesis 12. Then in the New Testament, the the institution of the church. And I would think that of the four, The first three rest solely and solidly upon the very first. It is the foundation of all four. Let me go back, as I said I would for a few minutes, and just look at the, before we get into Genesis 3, where man sins, uh, the marvelous truths taught in just the first and second verses in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. These first few verses refute the doctrine of atheism. The atheist says there is no God, but the first few verses in the Bible says that God does exist. And it it certainly uh, refutes the doctrine of materialism. Materialism says the earth always existed, but the very first verse in the Bible says, in the beginning, there was a beginning. It refutes the doctrine of evolution. Evolution says that uh, all things came about uh, in accidental processes and everything. But the first verse in the Bible says, in the beginning, God created all things. And then it, I think, refutes the doctrine of polytheism that says there are many gods. But the first verse in the Bible says, in the beginning, one God, Jehovah God. And also that of pantheism. And pantheism says that all is God and God is all. Uh, but uh, the Bible says that God is apart from his, he's related to it, but he's apart from his creation. So just the first verse in the Bible, and you have five or six false doctrines refuted. Now, let me just say this also. In the first verse, uh, uh, the word heaven is in the plural. In the beginning, God created the heavens in and earth. There are three heavens, and the first heaven is the home of the birds and the clouds. 
And uh, the second heaven would be the atmospheric heaven. That would be uh, the heaven of, I mean, the second heaven would be outer space, the sun, moon, and stars. The third heaven apparently is the present abode of God and the holy angels because in, in the second Corinthians, Paul speaks about being caught up into the third heaven. Uh, you can look over some of these notes yourself, and, and I think that uh, you'll find there, uh, especially how concerning, uh, for example, how old is creation, and we discussed that there. Is this world, uh, the earth itself, the universe, 15 billion years old? Uh, there is a lot of uh, recent evidence that would strongly suggest this is not the case at all. And uh, we give a number of reasons for uh, saying that. And then uh, the another question, and I'm always just amazed and staggered, and my imagination is fired up as I look at some of these statistical figures. For example, how vast, how big is our universe? Well, it's so big that it takes a beam of light that travels at the rate of 186,000 miles a second now, that's pretty fast. That means a beam of light can go around this earth, travel around this earth seven times in one second. And friends, there's only one thing known in the universe that's faster than a beam of light. And that's a choice piece of gossip. That'll go a little faster. But think about that, 186,000 miles a second. But do you know there are galaxies there are stars out in the universe that we have spotted with our powerful telescopes that may be as many as, tw as 20 billion light years from planet Earth. Now that means it takes a beam of light traveling at the rate of 186,000 miles a second, 20 billion years to reach planet Earth. Incredibly large. Uh, we have, again, a couple of um, uh, illustrations on that. I like the paper stack model. You'll have that in your notes. Let us say that the thickness of a sheet of paper represents the distance from the earth to the sun, some 93 million miles. To represent the distance to the nearest star, we would need a stack of paper 71 feet high. To cover the diameter of our Milky Way galaxy would require a stack 300 miles high, and to reach the edge of the known universe would demand a pile of paper sheets with each the thickness of each sheet representing 93 million miles. It would uh, demand a pile of paper sheets 31 million miles high. How great thou art. Not only the bigness of the universe, but the smallness of the universe also, and how much power exists in the protons and electrons and the neutrons. For example, German physicist Otto Gale has calculated that just a single drop of gasoline, if totally utilized, all the atoms in it and everything, in an automobile would be sufficient for 400 journeys around the world, a trip involving 10 million miles. Now, you talk about uh, uh, gas economy. That's incredible. And, of course, the key thing is how complex our universe is. We'll discuss this later in other studies. But could life come about accidentally? And the answer is never in a trillion years. There are certain things mathematically that could not happen. And one is that life came about accidentally. Uh, you say, well, you give enough uh, time and anything can happen. Well, let me ask you just one question here without getting off on a rabbit trail. How long do you think in the history of uh, birthing, or a mother gives birth to a child, of, of people, babies coming on earth here, how long do you think before we will read an account where a baby gave birth to its mother? You think that'll happen in a day, in an hour? Do you think that'll happen in a trillion years? There are certain things impossible to happen. When will we discover, when will we be able to, uh, will we able, able, be able to say that we have now determined on this occasion 
2 plus 2 does not equal 4, but 14. It will never happen. How great thou art. Well, Genesis 1 and 2. Now, Genesis chapter 3 and 5, you have the creation of all things and now the corruption of all things. And Satan then comes upon the scene and Satan is now going to tempt Eve into eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Prior to this, God had said, you, of all the trees you can eat, the tree of life, etc., maybe from the tree of music, the tree of literature, the tree of art, but the one tree you cannot eat of is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, she entered into a dialogue with uh, Satan, and Satan began by doubting the word of God. Hath God said? And then when Eve began to talk with him, then Satan denied the word of God. Ye shall not surely die. Well, and Eve and Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they did indeed die. Now, this is the first mention of the word death in the Bible there in Genesis 3. Let me just say there are two kinds of death in the Bible. There is physical death and spiritual death. And both can be defined by one word, the word separation. Physical death is the separation of the soul from the body. God warned Adam and Eve, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll die. And there's another death even worse, and that's spiritual death. That can be defined by the word separation also. That is the eventual separation of the sinner in hell forever and ever. And, of course, they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, And the sin then entered the picture in Genesis chapter 3. Well, uh, man tried to hide from God uh, by clothing himself in fig leaves. And the truth came out, though. And then God set up a portable court, as it were, in the Garden of Eden. And uh, he judged five parties. He judged the serpent and then the devil and then Eve and Adam and nature itself. But in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, the first 15, rather, you'll see this in your notes. This is called the Proto-Evangel verse, first gospel mention that he predicted in that terrible hour that someday a woman would give birth to a baby boy that would eventually deliver fallen mankind from their sin and uh, knock the devil out of the ring, crush his miserable head. And that would happen, of course, on the cross many years later. Well, uh, as we end chapter 3, you have uh, Adam and Eve being dismissed from the garden. And then in chapter 4, you have the two boys, first two human beings being born on planet Earth. Adam and Eve weren't born, of course. They were created. Uh, Cain and Abel. And they get in a fight, or at least Cain does, because God does not accept his bloodless offering And he kills his brother, Abel. And you have the first liberal now who refuses to offer a blood sacrifice now becomes the first murderer. And as chapter 4 ends, a very sad chapter, Adam and Eve dig a shallow grave and they bury their son murdered by his own brother. But God gives them another son to take the place of the martyred Abel and his name was Seth. In chapter 5, you have the genealogies uh, of Adam, and you read time and again, and it's sort of a first obituary column. And such and such uh, was born, grew up, got married, had children, and died. And you read that phrase, and they died, and they died, and they died. But one exception. There was a boy named uh, Enoch, and he grew up, had a son, But in midlife, we do not read where he died. But Enoch was not, for God took him. So he is the first person to get out of this crazy life alive. And he goes to heaven without dying. And later on, of course, in the book of 2 Kings, he'll be joined by another fellow who's translated that he might not see death. And his name was Elijah. And Genesis 5 ends with the birth of a baby boy that will become very famous by the name of Noah. 